welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside my co-host, Bob Pastorella, we are going to be chatting with Brian Kirk for part two of our conversation. If you want to hear part one, then go back one episode to 277. We chat to Brian about we are monsters, psychedelics, coping with anxiety, and a lot, lot more. But as always, you can listen to these conversations in any order, so by all means do listen to part two now and then head back to part one when you're done. Now before we get into the conversation, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! All right, well, with that said, let's not delay. It is time for part two of the conversation with Mr. Brian Kirk. And now for a horror interview. And I mean, we were talking about the idea of the mind turning against you, which is obviously a central theme, but I mean... What do you think makes us us or what makes you you? And if we're afflicted with mental illness or ailments of the mind, do we cease to be us or, you know, is it a different facet of us? I mean, it's always interesting, even like, I mean, something that probably a lot of people can relate to is if you drink a lot and then you have some blackouts and you don't remember doing certain things or you just don't remember certain periods of the night and Mm -hmm. I mean I I suppose I should clarify maybe it's not maybe that sounded sinister when I said you don't remember (laughs) doing certain things it doesn't necessarily have to be like a shitty thing or a negative but in even having that absence i mean what what is it that makes us us that's a big question to ask someone on this is horror (laughs) Um, so one of the things i've been uh attempting to do lately and i can kind of go in two directions here but one is to neutralize experience and what i mean by that is just not classify it as positive or negative Mm. uh but look at everything as is just uh an opportunity to learn you know, just observe experience as it happens and, and, and see where it, it takes you or what you can learn from it. Uh, um, there's this kind of interesting, uh, I think, a, a parable. Uh, I'll try and do it quick. I, I, kind of, I think it's from, you know, like a Buddhist parable. But anyway, uh, there's these two neighbors. They're basically farmers. And there's this fence that divides their uh, property. And, uh, and w- one of the neighbors loses his, like, stallion horse. And they're talking, and then one neighbor goes, uh, I'm so sorry about your horse. It's terrible. I can't believe that happened. You know, what I mean? you, know you must be so upset. The guy goes, well, who knows what's good and who knows what's bad? And the guy's like, what are you talking about? You lost your horse. Of course that's bad. It's, what, you're an idiot. So then uh, a few days go by, and then the ho- horse returns, and it's got, like, all these, like, stallion horses with it. It's, like, found this, like, you know what I mean, group of, of just these wild horses, and he brings them all back. So now he's got an embarrassment of riches of, you know, and the guy's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You, you know, your horse went away, now you have all these horses. How incredible. And he goes, who knows what's good, who knows what's bad. The guy's like, this guy's crazy. Yeah. So then uh, his son is out there trying to break the horses, to you know, and uh, gets bucked off one and badly injures himself, you know, break, shatters his arm and you know, breaks his ribs and all this stuff. The guy's like, oh, you know, how terrible, how terrible. Who knows what's good, who knows what's bad. The next day, and this will be the last one, an army goes through and they're, they're you know, recruiting soldiers to go to this battle that they're destined to lose. And because his son is injured, they, mm. you know what I mean, you can't recruit him. You know what I mean? So it's like sometimes something that seems like a terrible experience, you don't know what you'll gain from it. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, try and be more open to experience as it happens and try not to resist uh, or, or, or get too hung up on not, try not to resist the bad and try not to get too hung up on the good. You know what I mean? Because you never know. It's just a step along the way, you know? Yeah. I love that parable. And it does remind me a little bit about when we were chatting with Jonathan Jans, he said that his daughter, even during kind of bad situations or what you would think of as negative says, it's good because, and it's always looking for the good, even when you're just in what would seem like a bad situation. So, I mean, for example, if my wife lost her job, then you could say, well, it's good because she gets to spend more time with her daughter, or it's good because you get to have a reset and to look at, okay, what do I really want to do? So it's always looking for that silver lining and i mean when we left japan i mean it was a difficult decision and there's a lot of things that i miss about japan and that we love doing there but it's good because of family it's good mm -hmm. because there are even certain opportunities in terms of jobs and investing and things that when you've got your first language that just aren't open to you in Japan. So it's always looking for, you know, what is good? What is good in that moment? I mean, maybe you lose some freelance work where it's good because now you've got time to concentrate on other projects, maybe projects that you enjoy more. So there's right. always something. And I also think mm -hmm. that, um, uh, strength requires resistance. Um, you know, I don't think you can improve yourself in any, uh, meaningful way without facing hardship. Yeah. So, you know, like if, for instance, if I want to be a more patient person, I need to be put into a situation that, that requires the practice of patience. Mm. You know what I mean? So in most instances, when you, when you're in the, the thick of that, you're like, this sucks. Like, yeah. for instance, um, I, recently I was at, uh, the airport and, uh, the, the I was trying to go through security, and I uh, kind of running pretty tight on my on my flight time, and one of the two conveyor belt belts that was running all the luggage through the X-ray machine broke, so everything came to a halt. Right, you know, and what should have been a 15 minute uh, you know uh, line turned into about an hour line. I almost missed my flight, and I'm sitting there, and obviously I'm getting really impatient, and everyone's starting to get you know uh, pretty tense, and then I I, I it dawned on me, this is an opportunity to practice patience. And I actually said, like, I like, you know, whether or not I believe in a God, I, I just said, you know, thank you, God. You know what I mean? Thank you for this opportunity. Because this is, this is the work. You know what I mean? Without these opportunities, I can't become the person I want to be. You know what I mean? I, I have to actually be, if I want to be a patient person, this is the time to practice that. Yeah. And so uh, I try and use any, those opportunities. I try, so with my kids, uh, any t you know, when they started having problems at school, not that they have problems, you know, everyone's gonna have a problem. Yeah. My m wife's uh, uh, motherly instinct is to want to eliminate all of their problems and hardships. And I, you know, I was like, we have to look at all of their hardships as blessings, because without, without that, they can't develop character. You know what I mean? They can't. They, we want them to face problems. You know what I mean? It, it obviously not you know, disastrous problems, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, I mean, I think you have to, anyway, even if, if that's just a mental exercise, I think it's a useful one, you know? Yeah. Uh, I 100% agree with that. I believe that, you know, experience is a great teacher, but one of the things that I've learned is that there is a direct correlation to where, how well you adapt to something. Mm. Um, if something in your life changes for good or for bad, that your ability to to adapt to the situation, not necessarily take it in, but control it as much as you possibly can, especially if it's a negative, but learning how to change and adapt. And even if it's a positive thing, um, if I suddenly came into a monetary windfall that, you know, I would have the the, uh, you know, the experience to know, OK, then you know it's it's not it's this is definitely not the time 
to 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 do any type of sparging, I need to be exercise restraint. So that comes with experience because you've learned how to do these things in the past. You've learned how these situations will affect you if you if you don't think about what your situation is and change and adapt. And I think that leads you to a more well balanced person. I think the people that have problems in life is because they're facing they face challenges, whether good or bad. And they have difficulty adapting to it, and it causes misery and pain because they expect things to go a certain way, and they're not. Right. And so, I mean, all that stuff ties in. And it's like, you know, it, to me, uh, I find that the, the people that, that I surround myself with that can adapt real easily to things are the ones that I admire the most because I aspire to do that. And I think that I would hopefully be inspiring to other people and they see that, well, you know, Bob was faced with some pretty negative shit. Mm -hmm. And but he 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 found a way not necessarily to turn it into a positive, but to adapt it into something that was workable. And it allowed him to to actually, you know, gain a a better you know sense of well balance. Yeah, I love that, man. Yeah, and, and also knowing uh, everything is impermanent, nothing less. I think people get really hung mm -hmm. up because they get a windfall of money and they say, "Now I've made it. Here we go." Right. You know what I mean? Nothing lasts. The bad, yeah. you know, the good doesn't last. The bad doesn't last. You know what I mean? Exactly. You just gotta, you just yeah. gotta ride it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I think we're back to depression and putting too much stock in money again. There. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But I mean, summing that I'd like to hear a little bit about, which we normally ask as the second question, but we've had so many interesting things to talk about. But that is what your first experiences were with story. And then from there, how that kind of lent itself to developing, to you developing as a writer and deciding that was something you wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I was, um, I guess, kind of fortunate in that, you know, talking about purpose and calling and finding, uh, mine was made very clear really early on. As soon, as soon as I learned how to read, it's one of the most profound moments of my entire lifetime. I'll never forget it. I mean, it's like when it clicked, when the words clicked and I knew I could read, I didn't know why it was important, but I knew it was profoundly important. Something that inside me just came alive. In fact, I brought my, I mean, so with my kids, we make them read, they have to read 20 minutes a day and they can't stand it, you know, for whatever, you know, they just haven't found the right books yet or, or they're just would prefer to be on their screens or whatnot. I brought my, uh, my, in fact, I had to convince my teacher to allow me to bring my study book home, the little reading book. I was like, I want to show everyone that I can read this thing. Cause it, and I, and I just, I never, I didn't want to stop reading it. It's all I wanted to do at that point. I, uh, you know, I've always had, and I didn't realize this at the time, but you know, I have a, a pretty active imagination and I feel like this is the reading was the thing that kind of unlocked it. You know what I mean? It's like now I, I have access to stories that's going to fuel my imagination and I didn't understand it in those words or that, or those terms at the time, but I, but something, it was like an explosion happened as soon as I learned how to read and I never, I haven't stopped since. So, uh, it's, you know, I was a major reader from the moment I learned how to read and, uh, and had some talent in, in, in writing. So the only part of school I've ever enjoyed is when we got to write, it, you know, tell stories or, you know, I, the only parts of school I remember from, from early, you know, from elementary school and, and so forth are all the stories I wrote. That's all. I mean, I can, I can remember every single story I wrote in uh, growing up and that's about it. I can remember hanging out with friends and, and nothing else. Um, but then I kind of I got away with it from it as I grew older. So it, it it was always something that made me feel good. It's always something I enjoyed doing. It you know um, I always it was something I felt like I was good at. And then uh, as I got older through high school and realized that I got to you know f pursue a career and make a living, I didn't have the confidence in myself. Or you know I, I thought that was something that extraordinary people do not regular people like me you know I, I i just thought it was frivolous and unattainable so i i completely put it aside uh to become an adult and pursue uh you know do what everyone else was doing you know so uh i, I picked a career that i felt uh allowed me some creative uh outlet which was advertising 
and went right into it. And I, w- I spent about, I was there for about nine years, but really about five years in, I was dying, kind of like what you just described. I just, my soul was, was decaying. I was self-sabotaging. I was living uh, a really unhealthy lifestyle. I was miserable. Um, I was miserable to be around. Uh, and, and, and I, and I realized what was, you know, I couldn't stop thinking about writing. It's, it, you know, it, it just was always there. It's always, uh, it was torturing me. So finally I was like, well, f- you know, I may not become a, an author, but I, I'm, I'm going to start writing again. Um, and, and I did, I just started writing again and started, you know, churning out stories. And, and then my wife, who's, I mean, you know, I'm so thank you, grateful. I have an amazing wife. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't be doing any of this without her. Uh, was so supportive that she was the one that introduced me to some of the markets. It was, in fact, it was Cemetery Dance at the time. She's the one that introduced me to Cemetery Dance. Not that she was a reader. She was just like, you know, uh, you should send some of this stuff out. And I'm like, well, I don't know where to send any of this stuff. So she tracked that down for me. And then I started, you know, submitting stories and, you know, and then eventually I, I was I placed one. I placed about three stories while working at the ad agency. And then I decided I want to write a novel and that would become We Are Monsters. And I just was working too much. I felt like I was working too much at the time and I wanted to get out of that job. So I um, so I decided to pursue a career as a freelancer. And then this was the really wild period of time. I spent about almost a year, probably about nine months where I was working full time during the day. And then I was moonlighting at night, uh, building up my port, my freelance portfolio. Cause I didn't want to just quit my job and then start, you know, figure out how to do this. I wanted to have like a transition. So I was doing freelance work uh, at, on the side and writing. And then my wife, uh, and then we got pregnant at that time with the, with twins that we ended up having. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, then I just took the, you know, I, I took the leap and quit the job and, and transitioned over to the freelance and started writing We Are Monsters. And then, you know, and then that's just kind of carried over to today. Yeah. And I think, you know, there comes a point where you realize like, yeah, you can do things like work full time and freelance at night for a time. But for a time is the caveat. I mean, you can't do these things indefinitely and i mean when i was living in portugal i was teaching full time i was running this as horror i was doing freelance work i was writing and as a result i mean i wasn't sleeping as much my health was declining and i realized well summing out of the teaching full time this is horror my writing or my health has got to go (laughs) and it's like well it can't be my health, obviously, and <laughs> I'm too invested in writing and this is horror. I've put too much into it already. So even though the teaching was bringing in the most money, when you put it in those terms and it's like, look, you've got these four things, you have to prioritize them. And the one that's last is the loser. Well, it was the right. teaching. So it went. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I took a substantial, uh, uh, you know, pay decrease, but yeah, I, yeah. you know, but, but it's the best. I mean, my wife is so grateful that. I mean, we are so much happier as a, as, a, as a couple, as a family. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, she fell in love with with me and wants me to be happy. She didn't fall in yeah. love with me because I have the I have a, uh, financial earning potential. You know what That's I mean? Like, it. thankfully, but so. So it's been great. It's, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, obviously uh, writing has its own challenges and hardships, but uh, it's what makes me feel alive. So, uh, mm. you know, and I do it like most writers, whether or not I was publishing anything or not. Yeah. And this is the theme that is going to run throughout. Are you happy? If not, <laughs> what can you change to become happy? And yeah, we don't advocate people just quitting their job if they can no longer you know afford to eat or pay their bills but that's why it comes back to what you said before just having enough to have that basic yeah and i mean (laughs) if you've got uh, a high paying job it might be a case of well actually you could go down to part-time and you have enough to take care of your basic needs and sure some people will think wow that's a bit of a radical way 
of working but you know who cares who cares what other people think it's all about if you're happy yeah i yeah. gave up over half my salary yeah I, you know I, I make less than half what i made at that company and i'm but i'm i mean could be so much happier it's, it's yeah game to the two. yeah yeah and that's what yeah. it's all about yeah well i mean you just gotta you have to figure out what the balance is and that's you know mm -hmm. some things you know, I, as I get older, I've realized that there's some things that are ultimately going to be more important to me. Right. You know, and if I can, if I can still balance it, I mean, there's, there's hopefully there'll be a time when I will be able to move from a full-time position at my day job to a part-time position in my day job right? and still maintain the essential benefits, especially with health insurance that I need to have, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, it's, there's, and that's, that's my goal. You know, people talk about, you know, retirement and, you know, I, I mean, I, I've looked at my portfolio and I've got to do a lot more saving to be able to have the retirement that I'd like to have. And at the same time, I'd be like, man, I'd be bored as hell. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. You know, yeah. because I mean, I'm one of those people I always have to have something to do, you know, and it's like, yeah, I could I could sit here and say, well, yeah, I'll have more time to write. You know, I'll be able to write for 12 hours a day, which actually comes down to about like two hours, because after that, it's like, fuck, I'm leaving the house. <laughs> yeah, I burn out, yeah. yeah, I've got to go. Years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so. You know, because I tried those twelve-hour marathons. They, they, they no. so many, so much good intention <laughs> that just goes away after about a couple of hours. It's like, ah, oh, I'm done. I'm done for today. You know, uh, but I mean, it's you just gotta have a balance. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you're talking about the the writing too and, and the happiness. Uh, what I've learned th through you know my kind of relatively short career doing this so far is writing is really the only part of it I enjoy. So, you know, I always thought, uh, you know, you'd write a book that, that, that the real joy would come from seeing it out in the world. That actually is the part that makes me the most miserable for some reason. Um, I mean, I'm happy to share the, I want to share these stories with people, but it, it doesn't, it brings, it, it, it's so stressful for me. It's so, so, you know, uh, the, the business of publishing is 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 not something i enjoy uh the act of writing is everything um mm -hmm. you know i mean so i can I understand some of these people you know like like jd salinger and some you know some of these really great uh, authors who stopped publishing <laughs> i can understand where they're coming from like i never could understand it before and it's not something i'm, I'm considering i mean I, I really enjoy uh connecting you know i, I want to share these stories these stories stories want to be shared i think um uh, but it's, it's not something that brings me any joy, any particular joy. Writing is what it, it does, all of that. Yeah. I mean, in terms of a typical working day, what does that look like for you? So I split my day in half. Half the day is my freelance work and half the day is fiction work. The uh, fiction portion is typically three hours and I'm not, I can't crank out a bunch of words. I, uh, you know, I hit right around a thousand to fifteen hundred words uh, a day i try and write uh you know five days a week um i'm usually pretty good at, at sticking with that or i try and do something so i mean it depends on what stage of uh i'm at in on a particular project because i can't do multiple i can't multitask right. so i only work on one thing at a time from beginning to uh, uh completion and so uh you know that day's work might be editing it, which is going to look a lot different than drafting, you know what I mean? Or that day's work might be doing promotional stuff, you know what I mean? Writing an interview or doing a blog post or, um, you know, or, or any other thing. But uh, I try and uh, devote at least three hours a day to to whatever the, the fiction project is that I'm currently working on. Yeah. And in terms of one project at a time, if you get invited to an anthology that you think looks a really good fit for you and for your writing, but let's say you're working on a longer project such as a novel, will you occasionally make an exception and then just write a short story and then go back to the novel or can you just I will, not? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For the, for the right opportunity. And, and, and I've done that. Um, actually I've been fortunate to the last two anthologies that I, I, uh, was part of one was, um, 
the most recent was Behold, Oddities, Curiosities, and Undefinable Wonders, yeah. which uh, went on to win the, the uh, last year's Bram Stoker Award. Yeah. And then the one before that was Gutted, Beautiful Horror Stories. And in both of those, I, it, they, they came right at the perfect time. <laughs> Like, yeah. Right, actually, yeah, and I have one coming up that did as well with John F. D. Taft, uh, Seven Deadliest. Yeah, that came yeah. Right the week before I was going to start uh, my latest novel that I just finished. Um, so those have all hit at the right time. I actually just had to decline an invitation for the very uh, reason you're talking about, because mm. I'm a little bit more behind than I'd want to be on my current work, and I'm not in a position that I, I want to take more time away from it. Um, so yeah, I, so I guess I will decline uh, an opportunity if it's going to pull me away from the current project. Yeah. And I mean, if ever you had to make exceptions, I mean, to be in gutted and to be in behold and to be working alongside John F. D. Taff and another five great writers, I mean, you couldn't get much better than those opportunities, really. So I think you chose wisely or they chose you wisely. I mean, whatever, it worked out very well, well indeed. <laughs> well, the, the Taff one, I mean, I'm, I'm a he's one of my I, uh, he's one of my favorite writers there's no way i was going to turn that down it didn't matter what was going on i was going yeah. to take that down even though my instinct was to turn it down because i was afraid so my first instinct was how can i get out of this what excuse can i make that is going to that was just my first instinct yeah and i just had to overcome that and say of course i'm going to do this uh, no matter how much it scares me <laughs> and uh mm -hmm. and then it produced a story i'm really pleased with which is going to come out pretty soon so i'm so you, you over yeah if, if you're scared you're in the right place yeah and john was really delighted to have you aboard for that because i think in the episode that we did with him we actually spoke about the contributors in a portion that we couldn't quite put into the interview because it hadn't been announced yet but oh, right. yeah he, he was absolutely delighted to get you contributing and part of that mm-hmm yeah, we've uh, it's been a, a so I read the end and all uh, the end and all beginnings back in 2014 and immediately was like, all right, this guy is special. There's oh, you know, yeah. I mean, he's, he's mm -hmm. guy, you know, you know. I mean, I, I think I really put him on uh, up there with with the best uh, mm -hmm. storytellers working today. I don't care if it's horror or, or whatnot. You know what I mean? I think he is just yeah at the top of the top. And uh, I actually, as soon as I read that, I wrote an essay on it. I was, you know, it's not something I typically do, just decide to crank out an essay. But I was so moved by that book, I, I did it. And I, uh, I knew I wanted to meet him. I, I kind of stalked him a little bit at, at the first convention yeah. uh, that we were at. And uh, him and I have a lot in common. In fact, I, I, I kind of teasingly call him my soul brother because uh, there's, I haven't met that many people. Uh, I get along with a lot of people. But when you get right down to it, uh, I, I, don't, I, I there's not uh, a lot of people who think the way I think or, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm just different from most people. Um, but John and I are like, we are, I feel like he's, we're like separated at birth. Like, we just have so much in common. We think very, very uh, similarly. And we've struck up this really, really uh, uh, interesting friendship that uh, is, is leading to, uh, in fact, the project I'm working right on right now is a novel collaboration with uh, with him, which is unbelievable. So it's I, I, I never would have thought I would have gone from being blown away by uh, his his that book to to being a you know a creative partner of his. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's so wonderful when that kind of thing mm -hmm. happens. I mean, like if I think about some of the people via this is horror who i've published i mean all the people i've published i love their work but in particular to think that i got to work with nathan ballingrad and josh malaman i mean mm -hmm. no yeah you put out good stuff for sure <laughs> yeah and i mean me and bob have collaborated on a novella and i actually first became aware of bob through the booked anthology booked podcast put out this amazing anthology and bob's story was in my top three and then That's you know cool. years later here he is he's the co-host of this is horror and we've written a novella together that's mm -hmm. awesome yeah i think it's just about remaining open to you know whatever comes it's you know it's, right um, and, yeah. and not being in not being afraid to go after what you want yeah 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 um, that, that that's so important as well and mm -hmm. you know you have to be an advocate for yourself and you have to chase opportunities because they're not going to just come to you. Yeah. 
So with We Are Monsters, um, I didn't know, I wasn't a part of the, the writing community whatsoever. I, I had just maybe opened up a Facebook uh, page. I didn't, I didn't know, I mean, I, I read all these people, but I didn't know them as, as people at all. I mean, I didn't know, have one contact. And uh, I, so I decided to go to the World Horror Convention out in Portland uh, for the sole reason of having a 10 minute pitch session with Don Diaria to pitch him. We are monsters. That was mm -hmm. in my mind. That was the, uh, only reason I was going to that thing. What I didn't realize was, uh, what I, what ended up happening is I went and found my family. You know what I mean? Like I went and, and met all the, you know, my second family, my tribe, like that, that yeah. was, was the most important part of that, of that entire mm -hmm. convention. But yeah, I flew across the country for a 10 minute meeting with the guy I wanted to pitch my book to. You got to go after it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, with Taff, so this collaboration we're doing, I don't, he, if he already covered this, uh, we don't, we, you know, we don't need to get too into it, but we have this kind of, um, uh, what I think is going to be an interesting structure. We've decided, do you guys remember uh, Mad Magazine with Spy vs. Spy? Oh, yeah. So the thing with Spy vs. Spy is these two characters, they're kind of like the opposites of each other. One was white, mm -hmm. one was, you know, uh, stark white and stark black. And their whole mission was just to destroy each other. They were always going after each other, you know what I mean? Coming up with the most mm -hmm. inventive ways to annihilate one another. And that's mm -hmm. the kind of uh, collaborative approach we've decided to take with this. In that uh, once we kind of set up the, uh, the landscape and figure out who the cast of characters are, uh, he's going to pick some and I'm going to pick some and we're going to spy versus spy this thing. In that <laughs> he's going to try and annihilate me and my characters to the best of his ability. And I'm going to try and annihilate him and his characters to the best of ability. We're literally going, having a creative war through the characters we create. Um, mm -hmm. And that should, I, I'm, I'm expecting that to lead to really interesting, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll both rise to the occasion. Right. Yeah. And what you got to think about Spy versus Spy, it's kind of like if Wally Coyote had a brother who hated him. <laughs> That's totally And right. it's, yeah, because they're going to try the most elaborate schemes to yes. kill each other. It's kind of like, uh, in, in a way, kind of in a way with the, uh, the other version of Wally Coyote when he's uh, messing with the sheepdog. Right. And they clock in and out. You know, and when they're off the clock, they're friends. But when they're on the clock, they're more enemies. <laughs> that's it's, it's, perfect. You know, so that's what, but yeah, I mean, I, shoot, man, I got my credit card ready. <laughs> <laughs> it should, I mean, yeah, I mean, we got a ways to go. But no, I, I'm excited about it. Yeah, because I, I mean, I just can't wait. And I'm sure he feels the same way to mm -hmm. send him when I know I've got him in a, in a bad spot. You know what I mean? Just I can't wait to send that over and be like, good luck with that, friend. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think that me and Michael had some similar situations working on a collaboration is like, because we kind of, we had an idea of what we wanted to do. And so, and we, we both took, you know, it, it was kind of learning on, on, on both our levels, but at the same time, there was part of that, you know, I, I, I get an email saying, Hey, I've added some, some bit, you know, and it's like, okay, where did he, where did he leave me off? <laughs> you know, oh, now, now I've got to go and try to, to, to take this, this thread or move in, you know, the, the other part of the, uh, the story in. And it's like, it's a, it's a challenge. It's, it's like you, you, it's not like you're trying to one up one another. It's just like, you just, it, it, it's, it's, you, you're going to rise to the challenge of it. Yes. And that's the perfect word. Uh, that's what I'm so excited with each project. I try and uh, push myself a little farther and farther. You know what I mean? I just want to continue mm -hmm. to grow and, and, and growth requires, you know, uh, you got to walk out a little deeper in the water, you know? So, uh, mm -hmm. this is kind of deeper water for me. And I, in, 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 so I'm in the right, you know, this is, I'm excited about it because it's new and it's different and it's, it's, it's a different challenge that I've never experienced. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you two pull this off, this could be one of the craziest offerings we've seen in a long time. I mean, Goodness. It has the potential to be very interesting, especially just the style of it. It's it's this really intricate. It's kind of a, uh, a we're borrowing. Have you guys read Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell? I haven't. It's been no. It's been on yeah. my to read list for a long, mm -hmm. long time, and yeah, I purely because read. I want to read it. I haven't seen mm -hmm. the movie either because. I mean, once you see the movie, it's never the same to then read the book after. So, right, that book is magic. I would move that way right up to the top of your uh, read pile. It's just a brilliant, magical, 
just spectacular. Uh, it's probably the most uh, impressive cr- feat of creativity I've, I've I, literary, you know, the, from, uh, book I've ever read. Oh but, my uh, god, that, that's me, like the best endorsement for a book <laughs> ever. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It, okay. It, it, fine. It's, it's, it's at it's, the uh, top. It's at the top now. Uh, <laughs> You've convinced me. <laughs> but the, the, uh, the we're looking to do kind of uh, uh, a a story like a complete story, but it's told as an interconnected series of sh- smaller stories. So uh, you know, I mean, even I mean, it's going to span uh, even genres, and and you know, it, I mean, it's basically different stories but that all thread together and and tell a larger story uh through its entirety so it's going to be really complicated and difficult to pull off but that means if we do pull it off it should be pretty special yeah i mean is there a lot of planning going into it because on one hand it sounds like you need to have some sort of plan but on the other you're trying to one-up each other while you try and kill each other's characters so to be able to do that i imagine that you don't really want to plan too meticulously because it's a little bit like showing john your cards and you don't want to do that totally no i think we both have a very similar process and that we both kind of have a general idea what the story is supposed to be but have no idea what the specifics are um and and that's the way we'll approach it and i'm, I'm sure you know and, and who knows how long it'll take and that's okay you know what i mean the, the thing about collaborating is we can work on other things you know what i mean while he's working on it i can work on something else while i'm working on it he can work on something else so um you know i i think we we're going to approach it with urgency we want to get it out there but um you know we want to f- do the vision justice so yeah i mean um you know however long i would imagine a lot of it will be done in the rewriting i imagine there'll be some I bet there'll be some red herrings that, you know, we'll be, we'll be messing with each other right up the very end, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like in a way, particularly for the first draft, not only are you writing, but it's kind of a game that you're playing. I mean, you said that Mm -hmm. you get the most joy out of writing than any of the business of publishing. And my God, I mean, you you're gonna get a lot of joy out of this one because you are effectively playing a game it's a hundred percent a game and you know with a really good friend and someone who i really admire and someone who's gonna yeah. hopefully bring the best out of me you know what yeah. i mean because he's so damn good yeah yeah well i mean your latest book your forthcoming book although i think it will be out by the time we air this is will haunt you and mm-hmm. Here's a book where the clue is in the title. And if you haven't quite got it, then you can also look on the front cover and it says, you don't read this book, it reads you. And then if you get to the page before chapter one, there's also a warning to not read the thing at all. And that reminded me a little bit of Clive Barker's Mr. Be Gone. I don't know if you've read that but in the I o- have, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the opening he is imploring the reader to just burn the book and not read another word right mm-hmm. yeah no 100 percent. I, I mean that 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 i read that book a while ago and it definitely was something that helped inspire this you know that approach either works for people or turns people entirely off you know because I, I think that's one of his most polarizing books um, uh, I love that I, book. I, I love it too. Yeah. Yeah. And it scared the shit out of me for that reason, because I'm really superstitious. So w- Will Haunt You was basically me trying to um, to kind of poke all of my own personal superstitions. You know what I mean? Because uh, superstition is kind of silly. It's like this manufacture. You, you, you're scared mm-hmm. over nothing. You know what I mean? You're mm-hmm. like working yourself up into, into this terror frenzy for for no reason whatsoever at least that you know that's how i feel so i'm like i need to stop it was almost exposure therapy that book writing Mm -hmm. that book for me was exposure therapy i'm like what are the silly things that i'm really scared of these superstitions like dude i won't right now if you told me to go do uh say bloody mary in the mirror i I would be my heart would start to pound um i don't think (laughs) Act by Bloody Mary, but it'd freak me out it absolutely would freak me out i won't touch a ouija board no freaking way i just won't do it um, uh, and I, and that's, I think that's kind of silly or it can't, you know, I mean, I, I actually, I'm not sure. Maybe it's smart. Um, 
But, That's, uh, it reminds me of when Craig Ferguson had uh, Clyde Barker on his show, and there's like a short little clip of this, and it's kind of they like turned it into a meme. And he asked Clive if he's ever said Candyman in a mirror five times. <laughs> you know, Clive's like, "Yes, I have," and and, and Craig's like, "You did." You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> just, just thinking of what you're saying about superstitions. It is. It's they're so manufactured, it's unbelievable. But I, I would go as far as saying I'm a pretty superstitious person when it comes to certain things. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, with I, a lot of it, and maybe with the Ouija board too, it's a, a simple risk reward calculation. And you're like, well, if it's a load <laughs> of bullshit, which I think it is, then if I play with it, nothing will happen. And you know, so, so what. But right. if it actually isn't bullshit, oh, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> so, yes. you know, you put it in those terms and it's like, so I think I'm not going to touch the Ouija board. <laughs> That's a brilliant way to put it. You know, I've been uh, uh, interested. It would be interesting to me to do, conduct an experiment of people who read Will Haunt You and find out. So almost everything I write has a polarizing effect. Typically, people either really connect with what I write or really do not connect with what I write. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's just the nature of my work for, for whatever reason. And with this, I would, I, I would wonder what that uh, deciding factor would be. And I wonder if it's uh, the degree to which people are superstitious. So I would imagine hardline skeptics will, will, will not connect with the book because it's meant to really toy with your superstitious fears. And if you don't have them, I would imagine that this book would fall flat, um, but if you do have them, I, 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 anyway, I just I, I would be curious to know if that that if, if that is a deciding factor over whether or not this book works with certain people and uh, not with others. Yeah, I don't know because I mean, I would say that I definitely fall into the skeptic category, but then maybe I'm a bit of an oddity because I really also enjoy those books and indeed those films that try and challenge you and say what if so mm -hmm. i suppose the best way to put it is like the x files i want to believe right yeah maybe if you're open yeah yeah and who knows maybe that's not the uh anyway it was just something that i was i was thinking yeah. about but as, as soon as mm -hmm. like i opened well i didn't open i i uh clicked it on my kindle yeah. and, mm -hmm. and saw this warning not to read it i thought oh fuck yeah i'm in <laughs> i'm in good hands because i mean i i don't know i i think it's because it's almost like when when you have that with a book it's like a challenge it's like it's daring you not to go on and well if you dare me not to do something or you say I'm incapable of it, it's like, well, I'm going to do it. So for anyone listening, that's a good way to trick me into reading your story. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Mm -hmm. So I had this mental exercise going into it um, where the idea for the approach I wanted to take, and obviously this is an impossibility, but it was, it was just my mentality, was I wanted to uh, create the urban legend around this book up front in a way that if it was perfectly successful, nobody would read the book. I, I would, my idea was I want to try and create something that's, that, that would induce so much fear. Just the idea of reading it would induce so much fear that nobody actually reads the book. That is perfect success, um, <laughs> uh, which is an odd way to go about uh, uh, promoting something that you're hoping to sell. I mean, maybe what you need to do, and so perhaps discussing it on a public podcast is not ideal, but anyway, <laughs> is to talk to other people, maybe advanced readers, and you want to get them to kind of put some sort of warning out there and be like, okay, you know, I've read this book, like I wouldn't normally do this, but some fucking bad things have been happening. Just don't bother reading this book and in a way i mean if it worked it's gonna be a little bit like that thing doing the rounds at the moment i think it might be called momo uh, yes i've seen that yeah right. and mm -hmm. and really momo is a japanese sculpture in an exhibition but 
it's been utilized in such a way that they've taken that sculpture and put it into some YouTube videos and there's a whole lot of hysteria about how Mama is challenging children to do all sorts of nasty things and being put into videos of Peppa Pig. But <laughs> the hysteria surrounding Momo is far greater than the actual damage. And the, the main damage of people talking about Momo and almost creating a legend. It's like if you talk about right. it enough, it becomes real. It becomes yeah. damaging. And I mean, I guess as a parent, it's a difficult one. And there probably are no right or wrong answers here. Because if you see that kind of thing doing the rounds, it's like, okay, do I talk to my child and say, look, if you, right. if you see this, um, it's, it's obviously a myth. Don't worry. It's something some idiot has created. Don't listen to Momo. It's fake. But then if you do that, and I've seen people say this, you've now shown your kid that picture and they might have bloody nightmares about it. So absolutely, you yeah, have you to decide. Yeah, you have to decide, well, do I, do I show them this picture and then they might they might have nightmares or do i not and then what if they stumble upon it and then bad shit happens but i think the main point was that actually not that much was happening and it's only people creating and talking about it and showing it that has made it become such a big deal and obviously anyone who's sharing it and talking about it is doing it with the best of intentions they're trying to protect children but i mean well particularly in this age of social media and with the technology things can get out of hand pretty quick i mean maybe you need to capitalize on it maybe you need to <laughs> anonymously it's like well momo didn't affect my children but holy shit will haunt you <laughs> oh my god do not let it do not even bring it in the same house because there well, will be trouble <laughs> and i'm not i'm not making this up. so i know of three i already know of three kind of strange experiences uh that have, have happened to people two two uh readers of the book uh reported strange experiences to me and i had a strange experience i will be surprised if if there aren't people who have odd experiences and part of it is um i legitimately put some weird voodoo in that book the book has legitimate weird voodoo in it <laughs> um and i think that you know it, it, to your point it will it could build on itself you know what i mean if, if if you know if people have the idea that maybe something strange could happen but um yeah i mean there's already been three reported incidents that were that are deemed strange at least strange to the individuals that they happen to yeah, I, I imagine now if I said, mm -hmm. and for our listeners, we're going to recant that weird voodoo that some people would immediately turn <laughs> off. They're like, fuck, don't do that to me. <laughs> but I think as well. I, well, you know what? I actually, yeah, I, um, I, uh, I actually, so I, I, I approached it with respect. Yeah. I mean, there, the, you know what I mean? I, I don't want to, uh, now this is getting into kind of woo woo mystical uh you know but but so in in trying to poke my own superstitions i had to go all the way yeah you know what i mean i had to do the things that i'm most afraid to do and part of that is you know possibly conjuring what i'm most afraid of is that i might uh accidentally conjure a harmful spirit yeah you know what i mean that would be a nightmare situation um so i played around with that in ways that made me very uncomfortable. Um, but in also doing so, I want to make sure that I don't subject anyone else uh, inadvertently to anything that could be a problem for them. So I, pr I actually uh, uh, consulted with several kind of mist like people who are into witchcraft and, and, and so forth to make sure that I was doing things in a safe manner. But yeah, I, I played with some stuff that, that, uh, that is pretty spooky. Yeah, and I think Never I, I think irrespective of belief, 
and even irrespective of what is and isn't real, the power of suggestion is just that. It is incredibly powerful. So, I mean, even putting some of these things in, like the subconscious, as we said before, it's so untapped and you don't know what will happen as a result of reading it. I mean, people might have these experiences and I wonder what are your own personal beliefs in terms of, I guess, uh, otherworldly things in terms of the supernatural and hey, let's go for the trifecta in terms of religion. Yeah, so I am incredibly open-minded, but uh, I, I don't uh, take a leap of faith towards things that I haven't had direct experience with. So I am open to the idea that any number of things happen. I mean, just the reality that, that just our base reality is so bizarre and unprobable and, and miraculous in so many ways that if this is possible, who knows, you know what I mean? I'm open to anything being possible, but I don't necessarily believe in anything that I haven't seen or experienced. And I yeah. haven't uh, seen or, uh, you know, I haven't had any supernatural experiences. You know what yeah. I mean? So, uh, so uh, uh, I'm very open to it and, I, and, and I, I toy around with certain ideas. And, and when it comes to religion and, and, and things like afterlife, uh, the idea of those things can give me comfort and comfort is nice. So it's nice sometimes to, to, you know, to be open to those, to that, uh, possibility. But I, I would never say that that's part of my belief system. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty measured way of going about things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in terms of challenging yourself and you were worried, like, <laughs> you know, I don't want to conjure a harmful spirit. Was there a point where you thought, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I should do this. And not even so much for yourself, but just being aware that obviously you've got your wife and you've got your two sons. And, yep. you know, like if, if you do something that harms yourself, that's one thing. But, you know, harming those you love is quite another yeah, no, in all seriousness, uh, seriousness, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So I, I, I did. I consulted with uh, some people who are heavily into witchcraft and kind of demonology and, and all that stuff. Um, got a bunch of source material and got a bunch of like um, advice and, and, and guidance in terms of how to approach some of these things. And in, in the one big thing that they said, they're like, "You have kids, right?" They're like, "Don't when you're doing certain stuff, don't do that at home." Don't bring that into your house. So I was, uh, I, I absolutely, when I read certain books, I didn't bring, I, I always went somewhere else to read these books, to learn about, uh, uh, you know, aspects of demonology and, and, and things like that. Um, and in certain scenes that I was writing, I, I didn't write those at home. Um, and, and, I hundred, and, and in terms of how far I wanted to take or what all I was willing to put in there, that, that scared me and I thought maybe towed a, a, a line. Uh, I made sure I consulted with people about that it, it, and did it in a manner that they felt was safe. Yeah. And, and this is if you're going to take the leap of faith that this stuff is real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, I think in this situation, it might come back to that risk reward again. It's like, well, maybe you would think logically this probably isn't real. But then again, well, if it turns out there's any truth to it and... I mean, one thing we do know is that we don't bloody know a lot. So, you know, right. there are all sorts of things that we, that will be true, that science will later prove to be true, but we just don't know, we don't have that evidence yet. So you're taking a risk reward and you're like, well, if, if the inconvenience is that I have to read this book, for example, somewhere else and the payoff is that I don't harm my family. Well, I think that's a fairly sensible thing to do. Yeah, I, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, I would have it, I would have been too uncomfortable to do any of this stuff just because I'm superstitious. Again, it, it all comes down to that. Really, my 
writing this book again was was really an exercise of me trying to overcome some of my superstitious fears to face them all i mean the whole book is in, in many ways is is you know about facing and overcoming fear yeah I and mean, a lot of it you know i mean there's there's uh, aspects of the the book that that deal with possession and part of it is uh uh I feel like fear is a type of a possession. You know, I mean, we are you, when you're afraid, especially when you're afraid for when you manufacture your own uh, fears. You know, when you when, when you feel fear about something that that isn't an immediate threat, that's a form of like a, a possession. You know, what I mean, it, it it alters the way you think. It it maybe will prevent you from doing certain things that you wanted to do, or you know what I mean. It can hold you anyway. I I, I see uh, fear as being a harmful possession uh in in certain aspects and uh that that was that's something that 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 book is about yeah and you said that there was a strange thing that happened to you and that had happened to a couple of other people as well so what were they what happened yeah so uh i don't so i i did a um i i wrote a prequel for this novel that that i kind of uh uh I, I I released in a very unconventional way. I, I kind of did it as like a creepy pasta um, online blog series, and so it's kind of the backstory for my novel. And it, it's all I wanted to create kind of the, the urban legend behind the story, and it was all about this book called Obsidio, and Obsidio is basically Latin for uh, to be haunted. And, and so I you know I, I had this book created, and uh, and. I, I needed to have this book in order to create all the, all these, uh, you know, to, to create the story. And when the book was sent to me, uh, there was a tracking number and all this stuff. And I got both I and the person that sent it to me got an alert saying that the story had, the book had been delivered. And I work from home and my office, uh, overlooks the, uh, mailbox. But the problem was it, it said it had been delivered to a, the wrong address. So we're like, you know, so I went out to check and all the mail was there, but the book wasn't there. And it, it was kind of time sensitive. I had this uh, window of time that I needed to create all this stuff. Uh, and I needed the book to arrive at, you know, I couldn't afford to, to have much of a delay. So it was kind of a problem. So I'm on uh, the phone with the, the uh, UPS or USPS, you know, and we're trying to track it down. They're like, yeah, it's definitely been delivered. Um, you know what I mean? I see that the address, it looks like the, it's to the wrong address. We're going to have to figure this out. I spent hours, honestly, hours on the phone with the U USPS, and I'm in my office that overlooks the uh, mailbox. Right. And, uh, you know, my wife comes home from work, and she's holding a package. And I'm like, what, is, you know, in the, it was the book. And I'm like, where did you get that? She was like, it was in the mailbox. And I'm sitting here the whole time. I, I mean, I, I, I can see there, there, nothing came to the mailbox. <laughs> Not, there was no delivery because I was on high alert. I was like in an OCD panic mode about trying to get this package. You know, I mean, trying to track it down. So, um, so that was odd. When, uh, when they said that it had been delivered, had you gone out to the mailbox to check? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I went and, ch I mean, multiple times. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I went, retrieved all the mail, emptied the mailbox. The mailbox was completely empty. Um, you know, I was like, this was my full OCD. I mean, trust me, I'm when, when, when my OCD gets really triggered, I'm doing everything. You don't want, you know, so I'm on, I got like multiple people on the phone. I'm, you know, doing all this stuff. And uh, somehow it was in that mailbox. <laughs> yeah. And when, when you're, what see like i'm really interested in these kind of things so when your wife mm -hmm. when, when your wife went to the mailbox and like retrieved it when was the last time that you checked the mailbox like was this like an hour maybe two ago? hours before maybe two hours before yeah and like had you left that room had you gone to the bathroom and see i'm trying to solve it on this yeah, no, I, know. I mean I, i'm sure there's a you know probably i don't I mean, I recall I was in the front of the house and you can hear, I mean, I, I live on the dead end of a street. So, I mean, it, you can hear anything that approaches my house. I mean, I, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't see how it got, I just don't see how it got there. Clearly it was dropped off. I'm, there's, there's gotta be, there's, there's a, there's a non-supernatural of course uh, explanation for it. You know what I mean? I'm sure I just missed the delivery. I just don't see how I missed the, the delivery. And, uh, and it was really spooky the way it, it happened. Yeah, because you checked a couple of hours ago, but presumably you got the notification that it had been delivered maybe like nine hours ago or something. Right. Yeah, it had been. Yeah. So, and I'd gone a couple of times. Like I had, I had gone out 
Well, no, because I got the note. Actually, the person uh, uh, that sent it to me messaged me and said, "Hey, your book's there. Go get." You know what I mean? Like, and I was like, "Oh, hell yeah!" So I went out, and it wasn't. And I, that's when I was like, "No, it's not in there." You know, let's do the tracking, and it saw that it was delivered. Went back out. I mean, I, I checked it a couple of times. You know, I looked all around. Um, you know, and then yeah, I'm sure I, you know, went deeper into the house, and they dropped it off. I just don't know when that could have happened. But uh, yeah, but I, it has to, that's the only explanation. Uh, but it was a it, it, it strange situation. And then um, I had all these uh, uh, bloggers kind of help me uh, distribute this this uh, Obsidio prequel. And I sent them all copies of the Obsidio book as kind of a thank you. And one of them had almost an identical experience in that it was delivered. I, I don't remember the story and I'll butcher it. But this person messaged me saying something legitimately weird just happened to me. Um, it explained like, you know, explained it and it was something almost identical to what happened to me. I mean, it was, it was different, but in that it had said it had been delivered and it wasn't in there it ended up being in some strange mailbox or anyway. And then, uh, uh, a reader, someone that actually, uh, uh, was a beta reader, got the book and had it on his nightstand and, and left the room and came back and the book was missing and was like, you know, asking his wife if she had moved it. She's like, no, I haven't touched your book. And he was certain he hadn't touched the book. And the book uh, somehow had migrated underneath his covers. It was like at the very like foot of the bed underneath the covers. And he's just like, I have, I mean, I don't know how it happened. Clearly, I, I don't, who knows what happened? It happened somehow, but he was pretty unnerved by it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when yeah. you had all this happen, were you like, I think I'm going to throw this book out now. I know that. Uh, I, so, so I couldn't have been happier. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is what, I mean, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I like to, I, I, you know, I like to go pretty far out there. So, uh, you know what I mean? To, if I actually could be creating something that was producing supernatural effects, that'd make me pretty damn happy. <laughs> yeah. I just wondered if it would kind of violate your rule in terms of like, oh, for fuck's sake, my own book is now like moving around my house. <laughs> or like, <laughs> you know, is it like, oh, if you created the supernatural being, then you're safe. It's like, no, you're, you're like my dad. You put me into this world. I'm not going to harm you. We're cool. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's also the, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Who, who knows, man? The, the, the thing is so meta that that would ultimately be the, fi the final conclusion is that it, ha it genuinely haunts me. That would be the most perfect way that this book experience could conclude. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he, I always think about that, too, because it's like there's always like, for example, like in the ring, you know, right. you have the videotape and you, you have seven days. And to me, it's like there's there's never a character who would be like me who would see all this 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 death and destruction coming from it, and I'd be like the one guy who's like, hey, where's the tape? Well, Bob's got it, and I'm in the backyard, <laughs> and I'm just taking the tape and, and and just stringing it out, you know, and then throwing it into a dumpster and catching mm -hmm. it on fire, and I'm like, hey, I solved the problem. And then, <laughs> but in my story, that person is the one who's going to be ultimately affected in the worst ways possible. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm a hero. Y'all were too dumb to, to tear the tape apart, but I took care of it. You yeah. know, and then the rest of the story is me you know, in my life becoming completely derailed. Right. Because magic never works the way you want it to. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no. Yeah, it, it ultimately, this is corny, but I guess maybe to give some people uh, any peace of mind. With any of that uh, strange stuff that I was kind of toying with that, you know, around, I, I, I ultimately approached the whole thing at the end with like a, a, a abundance of love. You know what I mean? Because that's, you know, mm -hmm. so so th that book has more love in it than it has evil uh, uh, entities. There you go. <laughs> that's my intention. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Dan Hauer via Patreon would like to know, I feel like I can't move on social media for people talking about your book. This is good. I can't wait to check it out. How did you go about promoting the book and creating this buzz? Well, I'm sure he's talking about the, uh, that, that, that kind of prequel that I, that I put out there. 
Did, did, you, did you guys uh, ever see that? I don't know if you guys ever uh, saw the Obsidio stuff that I did. Uh, yeah, I, I did see a lot of it on on Twitter. Uh, yeah. That you know that certain people were were posting photos of the book and and uh and I was like that is that is just so cool. This <laughs> is like you know there's there's you know there's a a prequel book, the Urban Legend book. And I was like, that's, you know, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Well, what's interesting about that, uh, so the, the whole, both of those things, in fact, uh, there, there's more to this that that I have an idea for a sequel and another prequel, and, and who knows what they'll ever get done. But all of this came bundled together to me kind of in a, in a with a bow on it. So, um the prequel was always a part of the story experience. In fact, when I pitched it, I pitched the two things together. Um, and I was like, you know, they are part of the same story. I'm like, this is, I'm trying to create an experience with a book attached to it. Um, so it was always part of the design. Um, now doing it in the way we did it in terms of serializing it across uh, multiple kind of uh, blog websites uh, was a decision that came later. But, but in terms of having that, that, so I guess going back to, to uh, uh, the Ouija board, if you didn't have any, uh, if there wasn't any sort of like uh, superstition associated with the Ouija board, it's just a board game created by Hasbro. I mean, you would have, you would, you would have no trepidation about, about approaching it whatsoever. So mm -hmm. in order for my book to work, I, I, I wanted to kind of build up that superstition leading up to it. So it had to kind of have an urban legend around it. You know what I mean? Before before the book actually came out, so so that's what that whole uh, uh, like build up, you know, uh, was, um, and and it just so when it comes to marketing, that's my background. So the freelance work I do is is marketing, and advertising, and kind of creative consulting. And you know, I worked at an agency for ten years, so I, so I understand marketing and advertising. But the best marketing and advertising is are it's always storytelling, and so. It, when it comes to advertising this book, I felt like the best way to do that, and it was just part of it anyway, was to tell a really interesting story that involved the book that would get people excited about it. Um, and it ended up, I guess, uh, uh, working, you know what I mean? Cause people that people are crave, you know, they want innovation. They want, you know, something new, something different. Um, you know, it is, it's no, to no fault to publishers or authors, but th there's kind of uh, book promotion has become so formulaic. Yeah. You know what I mean? You do, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you write a, a guest article, you do an interview, um, you know what I mean? You, you, you get reviews out there, you know, you do author blurbs. It's just everyone's doing the same stuff, you know what I mean? So to kind of break that mold a little bit and kind of approach it from a, a, a you know, in a different way, I think mm -hmm. uh, is something that people are looking forward to. I, I encourage more people to do stuff like this. Find a way, you know, whatever your book is, uh, whatever the essence of that book is should be employed through your marketing. You know what I mean? Like whatever the world of the story is should, should I mean, the, the marketing shouldn't just shouldn't be separate from the book. I guess mm -hmm. marketing shouldn't be a, a, a business exercise. It should be a creative exercise. So, so in the same way that you uh, use your creativity and your imagination to create the, the book, t you, you know, use that same process in creating the way to promote the book. Um, it mm -hmm. should be equally as inventive and, and, and interesting and creative, I think. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, I agree with that. I mean, I've used, I've used similar tactics for my own work. I mean, I have, uh, you know, uh, I had, you know, with Mojo Rising, there was a lot of stuff concerning the doors. So there's, a, there's actually a, you know, a playlist that I listened to while right. writing the book. And, you know, so, and I always think those things are really cool when I, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm not the only one who's ever done that. You've done it. There's other things that, that anytime that you see something that's out of the ordinary, it definitely draws attention to itself. And that's, you know, we have to use, we have all these tools at our, you know, dispersal. We need to use these tools right. and not go with the same traditional, well, you know, we're going to get you on a blog tour and we'll get you on a <laughs> physical tour. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, I know that it sounds like, hey, you know, it, it's, but I'm not trying to disparage that because, yeah, that's all part of it as well. It is. But, you know, you got to step outside the box sometimes. 
Well, it is. And it, 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 I mean, there's a, it takes a lot of time and work. I mean, and not everyone maybe is that interested in doing that. Like doing the, mm -hmm. I put, so if I were to write, if I were to take the same amount of time I put into creating that Obsidio story, but it, apply it towards a novel, I probably could have gotten about 45,000 words. So I probably got about 45,000 words of time invested in that promotion. I call it a promotion. It's really a story. And it was one of the most, it, it, it's as much fun as I've ever had doing something because it was so different for me. I'm not a photographer. You know what I mean? I was, all this stuff was DIY. I was just at home with my cell phone taking all these crazy pictures with my neighbors and doing all this weird stuff. You know what I mean? I just totally immersed myself in it and I had a blast. It was so much fun. And what was cool mm -hmm. about it is once it actually uh, was being released because it captivated people's own imaginations, people started to participate. So it started to take on a life of its own where, whereby, you know, people understood kind of the, the, the legend that was being told and the idea behind it and, 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 and were kind of on their own spinning off their own little yarns. You know what I mean? I would watch people kind of start to have improv improv improvisational stories on their own. You know what I mean? It was starting to build out and people were, were, were contributing to the story. So it ended up being for this like really cool week, uh, this kind of collaborative story that was being told uh, live in real time that you could follow along with. You know what I mean? Which was mm -hmm. probably the, the coolest thing I've ever been a part of personally. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, we've got so much more that I'd love to chat with you about, but I think we're out of time. So we're going to have to definitely <laughs> yeah. get you back on the podcast. Well, I'd love mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. Thank you oh, for yeah. having me. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder where can our listeners connect with you? Um, through my website has all my social media stuff. So it would be Brian Kirk fiction.com. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Brian underscore underscore Kirk, uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. But, uh, if you go to my website that has links to everything, so I'm happy to connect. It isn't your, is your website Brian Kirk fiction. So that will direct, uh, it's Brian Kirk blog. Uh, right. is, is the root, but Brian Kirk Fiction directs to Brian Kirk. So either Brian yeah. Kirk blog. Or I Brian mean, Kirk. like, I, di I didn't doubt that you know your own website, but <laughs> I was yeah, just yeah. thinking, like, hang on a minute. I'm sure <laughs> that I was <laughs> on your web. Bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Um, no, I just, to you guys, thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm a big fan of the show. Uh, really ha uh, happy, you know, to, to spend this time with you guys. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I look forward to, to continuing to listen to you all. And I'd love to be back on at some point. I think this is fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we definitely want you back on and I mean, we, we've explored so much in these two and a <laughs> half hours. We've spoken mm -hmm. about like legalizing psychedelics we've spoken <laughs> about the benefits of meditation we got into mm. the 15 minute this is health portion of the show <laughs> spoken right. about the supernatural ouija boards i mean hey we've even done a little bit of writing advice too <laughs> there you go uh it's been good Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with Brian Kirk. Join us again next time when we will be chatting with M.R. Carey, also known as Mike Carey, the author of The Girl With All The Gifts and comic book writer of such things as Lucifer and Hellblazer. Of course, if you want to listen to that ahead of the crowd, if you want to listen to every episode ahead of the crowd, and become our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And there are so many reasons to become a patron. Not only are you getting all of these episodes ahead of the crowd, not only can you submit questions to each and every interviewee, but we've also got a writer's forum and I'm telling you, it's getting pretty active. We've got people submitting stories to be workshops. We've got really detailed feedback. We've got people 
talking about what they're watching, what they're reading, asking questions in the story help section. So for a dollar, it does not get much better than this. And I mean, another reason to support the podcast is to help shape the podcast, help determine the direction that we'll be going in in the future. We've got a number of goals. So at the moment, we're about halfway to our thousand dollar goal. And when we do that, we guarantee that we will be releasing two This Is Horror podcast episodes every single week. And at the moment, we're releasing one episode a week, occasionally two episodes, but we want to up that frequency. So please, if you can help us reach the thousand dollar mark, if you want to hear more This Is Horror, then that is the goal for you. Now, at $1,500, things are going to get really interesting. We're introducing the lounge sessions. And the lounge sessions is going to see me interview people in person. So we're going to have audio conversations between myself and various guests on all things horror, writing, life lessons, and a lot more. And I would expect that there will also be a video component to that. So if you really want to see us level up, then... You know, $1,500, that's where we're heading. But we're not done because we've also got goals for the $2,000 and $3,000 mark. So a little bit away from that now. But hey, we are looking towards the future. And at $2,000, patrons are going to get two episodes of Story Unboxed every single month. And at $3,000, we're going on the road so if you thought the lounge sessions were interactive, then you wait until we take it on the road. I'll be doing road trips in the UK, also some international trips. I expect there'll be some live podcast events. And hey, I reckon that me and good old Bob Pastorella will get to do a podcast in person, which is going to be exciting because up until this point, we've only done them via Skype. So if you like the direction that we're heading in and you want to help support us, then hey, it's www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. All right, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio, and you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And here is a succinct quote. From Elbert Camus. Get scared. It will do you good. So ponder on that one. I'll see you in the next episode with MR Carey. But until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. Thank you.